Okay, so why do not we get started? So, let me start with couple of announcements. Uh, first is uh, last call for scribes. There are several lectures that have no scribes yet I believe. So, if you are interested in volunteering please do. Otherwise, we will just run a random lottery and just assign lectures to students and then the expectation will be that you will actually take notes. It is not a lot of work and as I said, if you volunteer you may get a few points for class participation and it is helpful to the entire course, somebody is taking notes and also making it available. Okay? That is the first uh, uh, announcement. Second announcement is uh, uh, just a periodic reminder that we have no device, no laptop policy in class. I already saw people start using laptops and forgotten that you are not supposed to come and start browsing here. So, please respect that. Okay? So, that is the, uh, the second announcement. Third announcement is someone asked about the midterm exam. As I mentioned it, uh, it is the class right before the, uh, before spring break, which I think puts it around March 12th if I am not mistaken. All right? So, keep that in mind. If you had plans to take off few days before spring break, it might interfere with the exams. Okay? So, because the exam is I think the Thursday before spring break. All right. I will put that up uh, on the course web page. Okay, and then someone asked about where the course is being recorded and posted. Uh, it is if you go to the class web page and go to the lecture schedule, you will see that the lecture slides that I show you here, uh, the videos for the lecture and the notes that eventually uh, that you will all be turning in uh, will all be posted there okay, as will be the lab assignments and everything else. All right. So, let us start. So, today's lecture is going to be a bit shorter than uh, usual. I am going to finish our discussion of uh, Minix 3. I will also uh, give you a very quick introduction to lab 0. Okay. As the name lab 0 suggests, it is not a real lab. It is basically asking you to set up your machine because next week we will actually have the first lab. All right. So, so let us continue from where we left off last time. So, we talked about mini, uh, minix and microkernels. I talked a little bit about why microkernels make sense. Okay, there are many reasons. One key reason that we uh, decided is a good enough reason for us is that drivers are very buggy. If you put drivers code inside the OS kernel, those bugs can impact the stability of your kernel cause OS crashes and so on. So, it makes sense to pull the driver code out of the kernel and run it outside the kernel. Micro kernels are a natural way for us to do that because uh, any component uh, that is not core to a micro kernel can actually be run as a user level process including drivers as well as other processes. Okay. And that is what is shown in this picture here. So, you will see that there are drivers that are outside the kernel as well as several other components and I started talking about each of those. We will go through all of them today okay. and then I will introduce you to uh, lab 0 as I, as I was mentioning. Okay. So, let me, okay. so let us start with the micro kernel itself. As I said, there are three key pieces there. Uh, there is the IPCP is interprocess communication. So, it allows you to uh, send and receive messages, allows processes to send receive messages that it enables. Okay. There is the sys task and there is the clock task which I am going to go into next. Okay. So, the sys task which is also shown in the picture here, okay. you will see that the sys task is inside the micro kernel as is the clock task. Okay. So, the sys task is responsible for all interactions with all of the other servers that are running outside the kernel as well as uh, the drivers. Okay. So, essentially uh, the micro kernel exports a interface which are called kernel calls okay. and the processes that are running outside which implement various OS functionality actually implement the system call interface. This is slightly different from how you expect a traditional OS to uh, monolithic OS to uh, export an interface. So, essentially uh, this dotted line here at the top which uh, below which you have all the OS processes, system process and the micro kernel that is the system call interface. Okay? So, the sys calls are, in, are implemented by the collection of those processes. Okay? 
the kernel itself okay which is the micro kernel itself exports an interface that we are going to call kernel calls okay typically kernel calls can only be called by these privileged processes by privileged i mean their system processes their os components that are running users may user processes call system calls okay system processes call kernel calls to for ipc and other things okay so you got to distinguish in minix between a system call and a kernel call okay they kind of sound the same thing but they are not in this case kernel call is basically the micro kernel interface system call is the os interface which includes processes that are running outside okay so as far as sys is concerned it actually implements uh, kernel calls okay uh, so all and as it says that all kernel calls are essentially transformed into a request message that goes to the kernel the kernel handles it and sends back a reply okay and there are several different types of kernel calls for process management memory management access to uh, kernel data structures doing io and things of that sort okay so here are some examples okay so all kernel calls uh, start with uh sys underscore something so sys device io virtual copy set alarm and things of that sort okay we'll go into some of this in more detail in fact the first real lab will require you to implement a small kernel call so you understand how to extend the micro kernel itself okay all right so there is another component in the kernel a uh, micro kernel that's the clock task okay the, as the name clock suggests is essentially responsible for time or timer management okay so uh, it can you it the, this can be used to schedule another process when the quantum expires you can set timers of various sorts so when the, the timer expires you get a notification you can interact with the hardware clock changes time and what not and uh, most importantly what it does is every clock tick it registers an interrupt handler okay so at every clock tick you essentially the clock task runs it sees is there anything to do as a quantum expired is something else happen in that clock tick that needs handling and so on okay so and if so you will essentially do whatever you need to do in that interrupt handler okay, and then uh, there is at least one kernel call that it supports which is set alarm that a user process can essentially use to use the functionality of the clock task okay so you can for example call sleep okay and then when that sleep duration expires the call is going to trigger and then send you a notification all right so as i said before uh, the right way to understand some of this is actually go and start looking at some of the code it's not very hard to understand lot of it is nice documentation so even if you just look at comments you get start getting a feel for what this is about okay if any of you have a copy of the book the entire source code is actually printed as an appendix in the book okay however as i said a better way to see it is using the hypertext source graph plugin that i showed you it allows you to go back and forth and understand the code in a little better way right okay yes question okay that's a good question the question is there are three types of layers here if you'll see this picture there's the micro kernel itself there are these processes that belong to the os the implement os functionality and then there are user processes how does the kernel distinguish between call from a user process versus a system process okay so as i had said maybe you missed it okay the kernel actually only deals directly with system processes a user process cannot directly make a kernel call typically okay user processes has to call an interface that's exposed by one of these system processes and the system processes typically make kernel call okay or put another way okay there are uh, the restriction servers we are the rather the reincarnation servers excuse me allows you to impose a set of restrictions you can decide a policy which says who which process can is allowed to do what okay so in particular any user level process is prohibited from making a kernel call so if it does it's not going to get a response okay only system processes are allowed to do that okay does that make sense 
All right. So, going back to clock, so clock you can just do set alarm. So, so now let us go into each of these other processes that are outside the kernel. So, first one is process manager. Okay, so, it implements a standard POSIX interface, which allows you to create processes and what not. You probably know things like fork and exec. If you do not, you will soon, uh, because we are going to go through that in some detail. These are all system calls that allow you to do process management. So, there is POSIX level interfaces that it actually supports to do that. Okay. Uh, it basically also has uh, uh, IPC that makes it look like an ordinary Unix OS. So, there are three or so things it does. So, one is management, creating processes, deleting processes and uh, changing their priority levels and things of that sort. Okay. Second is scheduling, okay. you have to essentially decide which process gets to uh, run next. Okay. So, you are going to implement CPU scheduling. You will see that CPU scheduling implementation is not actually very clean. It is spread across two or three different things which makes it a little more clunky. Okay, normally, you would have expected all of that to sit in the process manager. Okay, some of it does sit there, but not everything. Okay. And uh, the third is your handling, which is to send signals, which are a kind of uh, so, uh, uh, software interrupt to one another. Okay, so, you can essentially also do that to through the process manager. Okay. Now, as far as the signal handling is concerned, it just essentially looks like exception handling. Okay. There is a signal handler. Okay, and then when a signal is actually sent to you, that signal handler will run. It looks, essentially looks like an exception handling routine and you do whatever you want in that uh, signal handler. Okay. Now, that is a standard Unix functionality. I do not know if any of you actually used signals in a Linux process and things of that. So, this is exporting exactly the same abstraction except that the signal handling here is actually being done in the process manager, not inside the OS itself. Any questions here so far? Okay. We have not gone into any details of any of this. Okay. This is just one slide overview. We will, when we talk about process management, actually look at the entire process manager in a lot more detail. Okay. This is just for you to understand what this component actually does. Okay. Next one is memory manager. As the name suggests, it is responsible for managing the RAM on, on that machine. Uh, again, from an implementation standpoint, some of this is actually implemented in the process manager. Okay. Why I do not know, okay, because you technically it should have been part of the memory manager, but some of it is uh, the code is actually not very cleanly separated out, but that is the way it is. It, technically, it is part of the memory manager, but some of that code sits actually in the process manager, but, but that is an aside, that is an implementation detail. What does the memory manager do? Okay, it implements a hardware independent memory model. Okay, what does that mean? It basically says that the layout of a process does not actually depend on which architecture the kernel runs on, because you want x86 machine, it should run on an ARM processor, maybe on a Raspberry Pi and things of that. So, to do that, you want to make sure that you do not actually incorporate a lot of hardware specific dependencies in the memory manager. Okay. So, the layout uh, or what it expects of a process is very simple. It is the same picture I showed you last or two classes ago. Okay. So, there is a layout of a process. A process typically has, maybe this is a little better, okay, not much better. Is there any other? All right. I will just use this for now. Okay. So, so there is a text segment for every process okay, that includes the code of the process. Okay, in in machine code, okay, and then essentially there is what is called the stack. I think is called data here. The stack is actually growing downwards. The heap is growing upwards. Okay, that's the view of a process you got to keep in mind. Okay, the uh, memory manager essentially implements that logical view, and it starts a process is going to allocate memory that makes it look like this. Okay. So the other things it has to do is it has to essentially track which parts of RAM are in use, have been allocated a process, which parts are free. Okay. When a new process starts up, you got to go find a piece of memory that is not yet allocated and allocate it to that process and things of that sort. Okay. These are concepts you probably have looked at or studied in an undergrad OS class. Okay. The process manager is actually going to go and implement similar uh, features in Minix, okay. not very different from 
what you might have looked at already. Okay. The next piece which is very interesting piece from the perspective of this class because eventually you will start looking at this in some detail later on in this course is the file server. Okay. So, the file server process implements the file system for Minix. Okay. Uh, in earlier version it was actually called FS, now it is called VFS or the virtual file system layer. Okay. Uh, and the reason for that, that is the VFS layer is a standard way any Unix OS actually supports multiple file systems. Okay. If you take any operating systems, you will realize that it actually has inbuilt support for not one file system, but multiple types of file system. Okay. So, Mac OS is going to support HFS, which is its native file system and now it is called APFS. Okay. It also support for uh, NTFS, which is the NT file system. You can essentially stick a USB drive that is a FAT file system, okay. it is FAT formatted, it is old DOS file system. Okay. And then if you have a CD-ROM okay, that has an ISO file system. Okay. So, these are all different kinds of file systems. So, to enable the OS to read or write data to storage devices or disks that are formatted in many different ways, you need inbuilt support for different types of file system. At a minimum, you might have a native file system and you got to at least support things like CD-ROMs and USB drives and so on. That is already three file system, okay. but there may be many more you may want to support. Okay. Linux has ext2, ext3, ext4 and whole bunch of other file systems. How is an OS, not just Minix, but how is any OS supposed to support all of these diversity of file systems? Okay. The way this is done is through what is called a VFS layer. VFS essentially stands for a virtual file system. Okay. And I am going to draw a picture here. I don't, is this readable in the back? Okay. We need to get better markers, but let me explain what a VFS layer does. Okay. So, so, this is an abstract concept of what a VFS layer is. Okay. So, this is a virtual file system layer. Okay. So, this is going to expose calls like read, write, open and things of that sort. Okay. So, which allows you to open a file and write and things. Okay. So, you have user processes that are running that are simply going to make those calls. You note, note that these calls are independent of the type of the system that the file resides on. Okay. This is basically file system independent calls. Okay. So, the VFS layer is going to receive file system independent requests okay. and then it is going to figure out what kind of device does that file map to, what kind of file system does it map to and it is essentially going to then forward that call to the right file system module. Okay. So, underneath the VFS layer, you might have something like a FAT file system. You might have ex okay, you may have NTFS and so on and so forth. So, every file system that is supported by the is essentially going to sit below VFS layer and when these calls arrive here, this is essentially a forwarding layer, it does not actually do anything interesting other than to figure out that call is going to be handled by this FAT module because that file is actually on a USB drive. FAT file system right? or it that file is actually on your hard disk, it uses ext3 or ext4 is going to get forwarded. To. So, what each file system lay module has to do is it has to implement a file system specific version of open and write and so on. So, you might say this module might do an NTFS read, which actually is the real code for reading from an NT file system. Okay. So, each of these modules are going to implement their own versions of read and write that is file system dependent. Okay. All of that code of that file system is going to be in there. Okay. So, this is a concept of a virtual file system layer okay, that any OS actually is going to support uh, any Unix like OS. When I say OS, I mean Unix like OS is going to support Linux has this and many other file systems have it also. Right? Yes, question. The question is, can the modules be added later on to support new types of file system? The answer is yes. There is a well defined interface that the VFS layer has. If you want to write your own file system, you are simply going to write to that interface and then register your file system as a new type of file system in the kernel and that is all you need to do. Okay? And you can actually add them 
they are in a monolithic kernel, they are modules, you can actually load them dynamically or at boot time. Okay, so, you can add support for new file systems very easily in this, uh, in this model. Okay, yes, question. Okay, is the question is the VFS performing a translation or is that more complex? It's the it's actually simpler. It's not doing either translation. It's a big case statement. Okay, saying if this read belongs to NTFS, call NTFS read. If this read belongs to EXTFS, call EXT. It's basically just taking this each of these calls and just saying if this belongs here, call the read here, read here. So it's just a forwarding layer. It's called a VFS switch actually, okay, because it's, it has a switch statement. Yes. Okay, question is can you embed different file systems within one another? Uh, actually, if you look at virtual machines, essentially that way you will embed a file system in another is you basically have a file okay, that it looks like a virtual desk and you can embed a file system inside a file. Not advised because it slows you down, but yes, you can do that. Okay. Now, let us come back to Minix. This is a concept of a virtual file system. Okay, Minix is also going to have that support now. I mean, in the old days, if you look at this picture, which is now a little old, you will see that it is just, uh, just as a simple file server, FS layer, because it had only support for I think one file system at that time. Eventually, they said we got to support more than that, so they turned that code into a VFS layer, okay? so virtual file server. So, what it does is, uh, essentially now, you can have a VFS server, and you can write your own file systems code and then the two can talk to one another. Okay, so, if you want to, just as you could have a module, you can now have a code for a particular file system that runs as a server process, you can have the VFS code and the two can communicate using IPC and so on and so forth. Okay, so, those modules are now essentially processes that run in user space. Okay, yes, question. Okay. Okay. Good question is why are we doing this in the VFS layer? Why is this not being done above? Okay. This is just for uh, transparency to end application. So when you write a Python code to open a file, you actually have to care whether that runs on an NTFS or something else. You just want that file and let something else deal with it for you. That something else happens to be the OS is going to figure out what the right type of file system that file resides on and the part of the OS that decides that is essentially the VFS. Okay? So, everything above that is really applications, there is nothing else above that. So, right, so the read and write, so question is does that, so where, where do you do this? So, the read and write call as soon as they arrive at the OS, they immediately come to the VFS layer. Okay? So, there is a, a process is calling maybe a library that live uh, f open or something like that. The library is calling open. Okay, that open directly comes to the OS. There is nothing else between. So, once it comes to the OS, it comes to the VFS layer. Okay, so, these are lightweight calls. So, you do not want to implement them at, at user in, in user space, but it is not extensible. If I add a new file system, change a library, for example, right. Here you can do that transparently. Okay, any other questions here? Yes. Okay, good question. Is this a fuse file system? I will come to fuse in just one moment. Let me just finish this and we will talk about fuse as well. Okay, now uh, I guess this is not readable, so I am going to go back to the picture. The one other thing every file server has to do is to talk to the disk driver. Okay, no matter what that file system is, whether it is NTFS, EXTFS, it has to talk to a driver that actually talks to the storage device. Okay, if your files are on disk, your NTFS will eventually take its read call and write call and send it to the disk driver saying, can you go read this block or whatever it is that you need to read. Okay. So, there are the two interactions that are shown here, which is a file server and driver really are three inter files of interaction. There is a VFS process, there is a file server process and there is a device driver process. Okay. So, the three are actually working in concert to implement file I.O. Now, let me come to this question that was asked about fuse file system. How many of you actually heard of fuse? Okay, only small number. 
but at least some people have at least heard of it. So, what is Fuse? Okay, Fuse is essentially a way to implement a, a user level file system on top of any other OS. Okay? It has nothing to do with my Minix. Okay, you have Fuse support, I believe, at least in Linux and OS X. I do not know if there is Fuse on Windows, maybe, maybe not, I am not sure. Okay? So, what uh, some clever uh, designers did is they said, why uh, limit this idea of a VFS layer to kernel, uh, to, to an OS kernel, can we actually implement a similar idea in user space? Okay? So, Fuse allows you to write a use, uh, process that sits in user space, it provides a file system that you can actually implement yourself. Okay? So, how will this work? I am going to go back to, because this is more related to Linux, I am going to go back to the old picture, not, not the Minix picture, which is you have a VFS layer. Okay, VFS layer essentially has things like NTFS, EXT2 and so on. Okay. So, in this mo model, if you are to write a new file system, you have to write an OS kernel module and plug it into the OS. Okay. So, now let us say you want, do not want to do that, you want to do this in user space, just as a micro kernel actually allows you to do. Okay. So, you want your code to actually sit there as a user level process. The way this works is in the fuse layer, you essentially have another file system you have written, which is called a fuse file system. None of these marker work. Okay. This fuse file system is essentially wrapper code that allows you to then talk to user level process. Okay. So, now you can write your own process as a file system, a fuse process, okay, connect it to fuse and now your entire file system code is actually going to sit in user space. It allows you to write your own file system very easily without knowing anything about an OS kernel, you just have to know fuse interfaces. Okay. One of the suggested projects later on in the course is going to write a fuse file system. Okay. The other alternative is to write a Minix file system by writing a new file server process. Okay, you can decide which one you want to do, but that is coming later. But let us go back to this. Okay. So, how is this entire flow going to work? Okay. Your user process, okay, let us say process A, okay. it wants to read a file. Okay. Let us say the files that it wants to read is actually being handled by the fuse file system. Okay. What do you think is going to happen? that read call is going to come as a system call in let us say it is Linux, it is going to come as a system call to Linux. Okay. It is going to go to the VFS layer. Okay. The VFS layer is going to say this is a fuse file system call, so it is going to handle, send it off to the fuse module, which some the fuse developers have already implemented for you. Okay. So, it is going to come here. Okay. The fuse layer is going to say, you can actually have multiple fuse file systems incidentally, but let us just assume there is one. So, fuse layer is going to say, where is the code to handle read? Okay. It is in that process. So, it is actually going to make an up call back to a user process. Okay. That user process is going to get the read call. Okay. Now, you have written that code to do read. Okay. So, you might have actually put that data on some disk or wherever it is. So, you are going to actually implement your own version of read, it is going to come back to the OS. Okay. As another read call is going to go for that story, and then come back and go all the way back to the process. Okay. That is one way to write a fuse file system. The other interesting thing you can do with fuse is you can layer file systems one on top, it is called stackable file system, here is your question. Yes, the point of a fuse file system is the user can implement, it does quite a few interesting, you can write a user level file system, you can also do what is called a stackable file system and I am going to talk about that. That is not allowed in VFS. Okay. What is a stackable file system? So, let us say you have a normal file system, okay. you want to actually implement encryption, you want to encrypt all your file, add security. Okay. You can essentially write a, a crypt FS layer. So, all the read calls to the actual file system go through your file system first, which is just doing encryption and decryption. That is all it is doing and it is making a regular call. Okay. So, it is just a layer that is not logically it is just sitting as a layer between the process and the actual file system. Okay. You basically encrypted file as part of a read, you decrypt it and give the decrypted data. When you have to write some new data that comes to your layer, you encrypt it and then just send that encrypted 
the data back to the device written. Okay. So, you can actually, so in this case it is not a new file system, it is just a layer that sits on top of a file system. You can do that as well. So, these are called stackable file systems, where you essentially have a cryptographic file system that is sitting on top of a regular file system. So, there is still data on the regular file system, it just looks like gibberish because all encrypted, every file is automatically encrypted. Yes, question. Um, Okay, question is does this what APFS does which is the MAC file system, APFS does not do that, it actually has specific hardware to do this for you, okay, so it has really a hardware level encryption, this is software encryption, you wrote a process to do that, okay, so they are doing this more efficiently in hardware, okay. So, so this is the kind of stuff you can do with Fuse, Fuse also allows you to do other things, so you can essentially mount a file system over SSH, okay, if you use SSHFS. Okay. Uh, so basically, you can essentially take, if you have SSH access to any server anywhere, okay, you can take all the data that is on that machine and just mount it as a file system. Okay. And then the, all of that is essentially being run over SSH. Okay, that is called SSH, that is run as a fuse file system as well. Okay. This allows you to mount any disk from anywhere using an SSH. Uh, all you need is SSH protocol, you do and then you are essentially sending commands or SSH and that process is then doing the actual read or write, okay. That is not even a local file system, there the data is actually going to a remote machine over SSH, okay. So, variety of interesting things, we will not belabor this discussion, oh, but so yes. All reads or write calls are going to fuse file system instead of VFS, like OS wouldn't know right to. No, so question is, is so you are still going to have VFS is going to be what you receive the read call. You just have a fuse module, just like your other file systems. You hand that saying this is your call, figure it out. So then fuse will send that, it just so happens that the real code, this is just another forwarding layer. The real code is sitting in user space, so you just hand it. Instead of having that code here, it is outside, that, that is the only difference. Okay, this allows you to put that code outside those. Normally you would have to take that and make this module here. You just put that there and you put a forwarding layer there, that is all it did for you. Okay, yes. Are you asking about fuse or what are you, okay, what is fuse? So, fuse is just a way by which you can drive user level file system instead of making them kernel modules, okay. So, that is all it is. So, instead of writing more modules here, you can write modules there and use that to send you the commands. Yes, it, everything has to go through VFS because that is where all the calls come, okay. So, two levels of indirection comes here, comes here, then goes there, that is all, all right. Anything else here? All right. So, let us move on, okay. So, we talked quite a bit about file server and VFS and what not, okay. So, we will talk about the reincarnation server, okay. So, this one is responsible for OS drivers and servers. The process manager handles user level processes. The reincarnation server handles system level processes, okay. So, that is the, uh, other than that I think they kind of do somewhat similar things, but there is more things happening in the reincarnation server, okay. So, if you want to start or stop a server device driver, those calls are handled by the reincarnation server, okay. And the interesting thing it also does is fault recovery, okay. If a device driver crashes, okay. It does not, because these are now running as user level processes, it does not bring the rest of the system down, okay. But something has to figure out that that device driver crashed and maybe restart it, okay. That is handled by the reincarnation server, okay. The way it does this is very interesting. So, it basically, uh, when you start up or boot up your machine, it takes all system level processes and it adopts them as child processes. Okay. Technically, if you are starting them, they automatically become your child, but assume that the reincarnation server is either a parent or a direct ancestor of all system processes. Okay. So, now if one of these system processes crashes or is terminated, okay, what will happen in any Unix like operating system is you are essentially going to get a sig child signal that says one of your child processes has been terminated or it crashed. Okay. So, because it has adopted all system processes, all the signals comes to the reincarnation server. It figures out what happened, okay, which device driver, what process crashed 
and then it can take any recovery action. The one recovery action restart. You say, let me restart that device driver. Okay? So you have automatic restart. Without rebooting your OS, you now restart that system processes. Okay? Now, of course, if that component is buggy, okay, it may crash again. Okay? So if it crashes frequently, after a while it will stop, saying that there is something wrong with the code. So it has a built-in mechanism that says that you can only do as so many restarts in a certain time period. If you see repeated crashes, you are going to essentially back off and say this component should not run, there is something wrong with it. Okay? So, it, so, Linux has automatic fault handling built in. Okay? You would not normally see this in other operating system. Okay? Now, there is something very somewhat like this in Linux. Okay? If you know what inetd does. So, INET is like a, a daemon that starts in the processes, system processes. So, INET D can also track when processes crash and restart them, but doing this in users, but this is a similar things happening in the reincarnation server. Next question. So, does, so reincarnation server is adopting all system processes as it's children? Is the process manager doing the same thing and adopting all user processes as it's children? Or the user process? Okay, so question is: If reincarnation server adopts all of these processes, who would, uh, uh, who is adopting user processes? Okay? So typically, process manager does not do anything about user processes. Okay? User processes are started by other user processes. Okay? Your typically most user processes are either started by your terminal shell or user typical user interface. If you double click on something, it starts a process, then essentially the parent process is your GUI manager and it is a child process. If you are in a terminal and you basically type a command, then the parent is the shell and the child process is essentially the process that started. So, there is essentially a process hierarchy okay, in any Unix file system and that, that process hierarchy is the same in Minix as well. Okay. So, there is essentially a command if you have any access to Linux, you should go and type ps tree. Okay. ps tree will allow you to actually see the process hierarchy, it will show you parent child relationships of all processes. Okay. So, that is typically and you will see that typically the shell is the one that is starting all of these for you. Yes, question. Okay, good question. What happens? The reincarnation server get killed. I think that then the system goes down. <laughs> That's my belief. But you can actually start kill it and figure out what happens, right? Because this class allows you to actually answer your own questions by doing this. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. So I think there are only a couple more components and then we will talk a little bit about setting up machines and so on. So, there is a data store component. Okay. This is a small, I think believe an in memory database with publish subscribe functionality. Okay. It allows system processes to store their state in the database. Okay. So, if there is anything important that is part of your state, you can also publish it to the data store. This way, if you are process crashes and restarts, you can just load your state from the data store and then you have all the information that might have been in RAM that disappeared when your process crashed. Okay? So, it is a generic database, but the more uh, in memory, uh, but it is actually used by system processes to keep important information that they might actually need for a variety of things. So, also provides you a pub sub interface, a publish subscribe interface. Okay. I do not know if any of you heard the term publish subscribe. If you take 677, we go through this in some detail. But basically, it is a mechanism by which uh, you have essentially a producer that produces a data item, it publishes it, and then subscribers can subscribe to date, uh, variety of uh, types of events. And then, whenever an event occurs, then the, the, the data store in this case is going to forward it to you. Okay. So, it is called publish subscribe, a general mechanism that allows you to receive events or messages from other processes. Okay. So, data store essentially allows you to uh, do publish subscribe, you can essentially subscribe to various kinds of events and so on. Okay. And the last functionality it provides is a very simple naming service. Okay. So, you could ask the question if process manager wants to send a message to the memory manager, how does it know what address to send it to. Okay. 
So, the way you are going to do this whenever a pro, uh, OS component starts up, it registers itself with the data store saying, I am the process manager, I am going to listen at such and such port number, okay, not a network port, but an IPC mechanism. And then uh, if, if you want to figure out where the memory manager is running, process manager is running, you just essentially send a request to the data store, it is going to tell you okay, where each of these processes are running. Okay, so, it has a naming service on top of everything else. Okay. How do you know where the data store is running? Yes. Okay. It has to have fixed. This is a standard problem with any naming service. There is nothing interesting that I asked. Okay. Every naming service needs to be listening on some well known location. So, you can actually ask it about something else. If you do not know where the naming service runs, you cannot ask it anything. Okay, so, you might not need to know where anything else is executing, but at least has to know where the naming service is running. So, so it has to listen to some well known location. So, you cannot register itself at some well known location. So, anyone can make requests of it. Okay, otherwise, if you cannot find the naming service, then you are no, you are in trouble. All right. Any other? Yes. No, the data store is actually a separate component as you will see here. Okay, the reincarnation server and data store are two different servers. Okay. Okay, and again, if you have these kinds of questions, what you should really do is you go into the code and then you will see okay, that uh, if you go here, right. So, you will see in servers, you have the data store okay, which is here okay, and the reincarnation server, these are different server components okay, and they are things that you can understand easily. Okay. So, data store, okay, then very little bit of information on faults and so on, then we will actually go and look at the lab 0, etcetera. So, we already said that Minix has good features to detect faults and recover from faults and so on, but there are also features to isolate fault. Okay. So, uh, servers and drivers, they run in their own address space, they are all user level processes. Okay. Uh, they are protect, they have memory level protection. So, one process cannot go look up at uh, memory space belonging to other process, user processes have the same level of protection. Okay. Now, the other thing is the restriction, uh, the re reincarnation server sets restrictions for user level processes. Okay. This is what I said, you cannot make direct kernel calls and so on. Okay. Only system processes are allowed to uh, do that. Okay. Ordinary processes cannot request kernel services. They have to contact a POSIX server, which is then essentially going to make that request for you. Right? So, you use the data store to essentially figure out what may have changed, what may have crashed and so on. Okay? So, your file server for example, can subscribe to disk events. Okay? Uh, when there is a driver crash, okay, the reincarnation server will essentially figure out that it crashed. It can essentially tell the file server saying this device driver has crashed okay, and maybe the file server say let us restart it and then you can restart. So, some of this fault handling logic is built in, it is like exception handling. If you write written Java code, you know what I am talking about. right? So, all of the same kind of stuff has to actually happen here because you are going to be told what has happened. If you are writing a monolithic kernel, you will essentially have other problems because the, if you have one component crashing, it is going to take down the entire kernel. In this case, only part of the OS is crashed, so you can take corrective action, which is essentially what is being done here. Okay. So, you are using a combination of the data store, okay, which is going to track these events and then deliver it to the right processes saying this thing has crashed and so on and then you can handle that message by restarting or doing something else. So, last piece before we end the discussion of the over Minix overview is performance. Okay. We, we, when we started this discussion, maybe two or three classes ago, we said one of the downsides of micro kernels is that performance is actually going to be uh, slower than monolithic kernels because there is lots of interaction between user level processes that implement OS functionality. Okay. So, the, the paper that is, is the third of the paper that I had uh, spoken about last time has some details on what the performance impact. I do not think they actually did enough uh, profiling to uh, answer that question definitively, but they did 
have some information. So, for example, they said what is the impact of taking drivers from the kernel address space and putting them as their own user level processor. Answer is 10 percent, not a big overhead, slow down for sure, but not a huge slowdown. Okay. Uh, they said what is the overhead of actually doing file IO? Okay, their answer, I mean, this is all in the paper saying 7 percent. Okay. Fine. So, that is perfectly okay. What they did not answer is what slow down to actual application process C for doing variety of comment tasks. So, that level of benchmarking is not presented here. Normally, you would want to see how the OS as a whole is performing by running some standard benchmark that says what is the overall impact of building a micro kernel as opposed to doing it some other way. Okay, that was not shown in the paper, but be that as it may, uh, they did try to answer some questions and they are uh, presenting a view that says the overhead is around 10 percent and not, not huge. Okay. You can actually try it and figure this out. You can run Minix and see does it perform as well as they claim it to be. Okay, any questions here before I show you a few different things? Yes. Okay. Question is, does user level process, can it access the data store? I am not sure. I think that you have to go through. Yes, it looks like you cannot, but I am not sure actually. The, the figure is uh, somewhat dated, okay. so it may not actually reflect why, uh, what has actually happened now. Okay. I do not think there is a direct interface it publishes, but I do not know that for a fact. Okay. So, take my answer with a grain of salt. All right. So, now uh, let me spend a little time showing you a few things. Okay. So, first thing is uh, you have to start installing stuff. So, you are ready for the actual lab. Okay. So, the lab 0 that is coming out later today is just set up. It is not real lab, not graded. So, you do not have to actually think about what grade up you are going to get for this lab. It is all about setting virtual box and setting up Minix and so on. So, you are ready for doing something interesting starting next week. Okay. Next week, I think we will have the first lab out which will involve doing some sort of system call, kernel call plus maybe a toy server process. Okay. So, you know how to write the OS component, how to change the interface of the OS and things of that. So, Okay. So, that is the first real lab, but the, the lab 0 is all set up. So, the thing you got to do is first go get the source graph plugin, okay. put it in a browser uh, which has to be either Chrome or Firefox, those are the only two browsers you can actually use and then once you are done that you will see that button there. Okay. You can go to any GitHub repo and uh, you will see that button, you click on that and you essentially get that same repo in a browsable fashion. Okay. So, you can then examine Minix code and so on. Uh, we will provide you pointers to where Minix is. We have a fork of it in our course repository. So, of course, that is the definitive version that you are more than welcome to browse. It does not matter, it is going to be the same code. Okay. So, that is the first thing. So, you can actually read some code, you got to do that. Okay. The second thing which is essentially this is the description of lab 0, it is going to be made available to you. Okay. You got to install virtual box. Okay, that is essentially all of your uh, Minix stuff is going to run on virtual machine. It's much easier than actually running things on uh, physical machine. Okay. Maybe about 15 years ago when I taught this class, we actually had a set of PCs where you had boot stuff and you would crash your kernel, you would corrupt the disk and then you got to reinstall everything. Much more painful. Now, you can do everything in virtual machine. So, you can even snapshot your virtual machine, you corrupt it, you go to the previous snapshot, everything is back to where it was and so much easier to deal with. So, you are going to do everything inside a VM. So, you have to get VA virtual box, that is your uh, free version. Okay. If you really want, you can do things on VMware or Parallels, but we do not recommend it. Let us stick to VirtualBox, it is much easier. Okay. So, you are going to install that. Then we are, uh, just to get you started, we gave you a pre-packaged Minix VM. Okay. You can simply boot it and look at what Minix looks like, okay, which I am going to show you. Okay. So, so here is VirtualBox. Okay. So, you essentially you can just boot. So, that is your Minix VM. So, you can just start it and it will just start booting. Okay, so, you will get that boot prompt and then you can just start booting it. I am just going to say start. So, it starts booting and then you are going to get a prompt. Uh, 
Okay, it's doing something, so that is booted up. So you can then log in, and then you have Minix. Okay, so this is basically just a VM that's running Minix. Okay, you will be root. Okay, hash prompt is essentially means root, which means you can just delete whatever you want to do. Well, uh, something that's bad. So be sure you know what you're doing before you type something. Of course, if you're deleted, you can always go get a, a new VM. You've got to understand some basic commands and understand what you're doing. Okay? Now, a few things you need to know. You there is a difference. Uh, there's a difference between pausing a VM and shutting down the VM. Okay? Pause is like hibernate. Okay? You can essentially resume from exactly where you left off. Okay. Shutting it down is like powering it down. Okay. So, you need to know some of these things. The other thing you need to know is the source code for Minix essentially lives inside the VM. Okay. So, so, if you actually go to user source, okay. so you will see all the code I was showing you on GitHub, it is actually in here. Okay. So, to at least minimally to compile it, you will need the VM. Okay. You can also develop the code inside the VM and I am going to show you some examples of how to do that, but I would recommend that you actually use GitHub and check in things and only once you develop the code, maybe put here speed just for compilation. Okay. So, you might want to think how do you want to do this in a rather than do develop and build inside the VM and you crash the VM, your code is also gone and then you build it, okay. better way, but it is up to you okay, what you want to do. Right. Whatever you do, save a copy of your code before you boot a kernel that you actually uh, use. Okay. So, the few things you need to know is if you want to act, uh, use that code, you can essentially connect to this using SFTP and do some stuff. So, I am going to show you. Okay. So, here you can, we, we recommend use Eclipse, but any editor that essentially has F SFTP support allows you to directly edit inside the uh, inside that VM. So, I am just going to connect to that VM. So, I just said localhost root. Okay. So, now you can see that it is actually connected to uh, and that is the file system inside. You can essentially go to user source and I can just go into kernel Okay, it does not matter, I went to here. So, I can essentially then do this, that is the code that is inside the VM, it, I can actually edit it in a browser on my machine. Okay, so, you do not have to uh, use VI and things of that sort, you can essentially any edit that has some sophisticated SFTP capability. Eclipse is a free one, the, the lab requires you to at least minimally use Eclipse if nothing else. Okay. This also allows you to then build inside and what not. Okay. Just a few things to keep in mind. Now, of course, if you just decide you are just going to use GitHub, you can just use whatever you just check out the code from GitHub, do whatever you want, check it back in, go inside the VM, check it out inside the VM from GitHub and then just build it there. That is the easier part. So, you then your code is actually going to live on either your machine and GitHub and not necessarily being built inside. Oh, well, it is going to be built inside, but not developed inside the VM. Okay. But the Minix book actually says this is a good way to do it, I do not think it is necessarily a good way to do it, because you are going to crash your kernel very quickly okay, and then you might just wipe out all your files. All right. So, few of these things you need to keep in mind. I am just going to close this, close that. Okay. So, so this is the prepackaged VM, okay, which we already created for you. All you are going to do is install virtual box, download that image and you just start it and that is what you are going to get. But the, you also have to know how to create your own. So, the lab requires you to uh, essentially create, a, make a blank VM, install Minix on it, not very difficult because all the installation instructions are all there and then essentially create the same VM we created. Okay. This allows you to know how to create your own virtual machine, which you can then use. Okay. So, that is essentially your step number two, creating your own Minix VM. Okay. Then step number three is you need to know a little bit of Unix commands to use Minix, because it is always giving you the shell prompt. Okay. Okay, I think there is a way to implement X and so on, but X windows, but it is too complicated. If you want, you can try that. So, you need to minimally know how to use a shell prompt. Okay. 
there is some Unix tutorial will give you, so you need to know some basic commands. If you already know this, then you can actually skip this step. Okay. I showed you how to access that machine remotely in the browser. Yes, question. Yes, the question is if you install the VM, will it have internet access? Typically what VirtualBox does is that essentially it provides a NATed interface to the VM. So your VM is actually going to use your machine's IP address, but it is NATed inside. Okay, so, but you do not really need to worry about it. You can access from inside that VM anything on the internet, not vice versa, because it is behind a NAT box that is running inside VirtualBox. Okay? All right. So, you are going to install Eclipse, then you are going to compile a kernel. You have a question? No. Okay. All right. So, the next step is actually you are going to install, not install, but know how to compile a kernel because the entire course is about making changes to the kernel. So, you better know how to compile one. So, you will compile the default kernel, you will install that kernel and then you will boot that kernel. Make sure you know how to do those steps. Of course, that kernel hopefully will boot well because it is not modified kernel. Okay. The good thing in uh, Minix is you always have two kernels, the choice of two kernels to boot from the default one and then the one you installed. So, if you write some code, compile a kernel, boot it, does not boot, you can restart the VM and at that boot prompt say do the other one. So, you always, so then it will boot the default one. So, you are never overwriting the default kernel, you just have a second one to boot from. So, your boot loader actually allows you to decide which one you want. Okay, this way you can test one and if it does not work, you still have access to your VM, you did not destroy the original kernel. These are some nice features that you will actually use frequently. Okay. So, that is your Minix kernel and then that is it. Okay. At that point, you set everything up and you are ready for the actual lab that we are going to give. Right. So, make sure you do all of that this week okay. and then maybe next week, we are going to actually give you a real lab to work with. Okay. We will also, for those of you who are not familiar with Unix shell commands, you may have even used Unix, but if you use KDE or whatever some GUI, you may not know enough shell, we will give you a tutorial on shell. If you are rusty on C, we will give you a tutorial on C, but you better learn quickly because you are going to start programming a kernel. Okay, that is like uh, you know learning to crawl and then jumping into the ocean. So, it is like a big step. So, <laughs> so be, be sure to get up to speed fairly quickly. All right. So, that is it for today. We will end a little early, continue next week.